Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to Carla Dawn Live. I'm Carla Gordy Bristol and I'm very happy about my show guest today. We have a lot to talk about. I had to journey through lots of traffic to make it here to see Mr. Walter Tucker the <laughs> third. Hi. Hey, Carla. <laughs> I'm here. Doing? Hey, we finally <laughs> Yes, we, did this, we huh? finally did this. And I told you. I said you we're going to make it happen. You did. We met at the 10th Council District Women's Steering Committee. I That's was the right. MC of mm -hmm. a luncheon, the annual right. luncheon. And you were there with your new book That's that right. we'll be talking about. Right. It's here. This is uh, From Compton to Congress. So we're going to get a, a little discussion on that too later, and you could tell us about that journey through the show. No problem. Uh, but I was impressed by the book. You know, you gave me a copy, signed that day. I appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to everyone here learning about your amazing journey. You've navigated a lot yeah. over the years. It's, uh, that's really the reason that I wrote the book, because people kept... Uh, telling me you have such an interesting life mm -hmm. and of course the book actually is just a third of my life so <laughs> wow. there's two more books to come uh, that's so good give them a little bit yeah, give them yeah, a little this bit this is volume one okay but uh, being in public life mm -hmm. uh, 25 years ago uh, having been the mayor of Compton and then shortly thereafter going to Congress and yeah. uh, being the only African American to go to Congress US Congress from Compton uh, so a wow. lot of things that happened and people said, you know, you really had an interesting life and mm -hmm. uh, one of my quotes in fact is that, you know, we live a lot of lives within a lifetime yes. and that's true. We're not, yes. you know, always at the same job. We don't always live the same place and mm -hmm. so I've had a lot of uh, different chapters right. in my book and I just uh, felt it was time to put uh, pen to paper or Keyboard to paper. I know, nowadays. <laughs> Some people like the paper still, though. They go no, the old-fashioned way. I'm, I'm definitely keyboard. Also, people, you know, talk, talk yeah, text and talk type. Exactly. So, <laughs> yeah, that, that's there, too. Wow. Well, you, like I say, you're an author. You've done so many different things. And this is just a few. When I started to write down the different things you've done, I was like, well, do I just list the whole you know, gamut? <laughs> nah, we'll let you tell everybody. But the book, um, you were the L.A. County District Attorney. Yeah, I was right? a deputy DA okay. uh, for L.A. County many years ago. Um, telling my age when Philip Bozian <laughs> was district attorney. Okay, so, just a few yeah. years ago, yeah, no, just, not yeah, too yeah, long right, ago. Yeah, right. So, uh, and uh, then after that episode, I uh, I went to be a private defense attorney. And uh, interestingly enough, I was going to be a public defender. Okay. But uh, as it is explained in the book, uh, my dad recommended that I go talk to a friend of his who was a judge at the time, mm -hmm. Judge Tom Thompson. And he said, no, you don't want to be a public defender. You want to be a prosecutor. I said, why? He said, because you got to find out how they think and what they do. <laughs> so you're going to spend the rest of your life being on the, you know, yeah. on the defense. He said, but get in there and find out, uh, mm -hmm. you know, be the I fly on the wall. And, and, and he, I think he had a lot of uh, merit there. He was right. I, get I it. Yeah. went in and became a prosecutor, mm -hmm. but I didn't stay a prosecutor. You didn't stay. Now, when your father gave you that advice, he was the mayor of Compton, correct? Yes, or? that's exactly right. Yeah. So he knew a lot of people and he had a lot of resources mm -hmm. and he was a very wise man and, and I listened. And you, I was about to say it, that's the key. People have to listen yeah. because, yeah. you know, the information is there. So many people hear it, but they aren't receiving it, right? Yeah. In fact, that's really, not to get ahead of us, but it's really one of the reasons why I wrote the book is to pass down wisdom, mm. uh, particularly to the next generation. Right. And as you just so wisely said, mm -hmm. uh, someone has to listen, someone has to receive it. Right. Uh, you know, as I said, my dad and that generation, they had a lot of wisdom uh, and I did, I did listen. In fact, that's one of the reasons why a lot of my father's quotes are in the book. Oh, nice. But as I went through my life, mm -hmm. the good, the bad, and the ugly, I wanted to memorialize it and pass down that wisdom and with the prayer that somebody would pick it up at some point and say, hey, you know what, I've learned a lot from this. And one of the greatest compliments that I've had mm -hmm. uh, since writing the book yeah. has been some young men who come up to me. Mm -hmm. In fact, one uh, gentleman, was a minister, local minister, he came uh, to the church here and he said, look, he said, I, I, I want to say something. I said, okay, I didn't know <laughs> what he was going to say. But yeah. he walked up and he had a copy of the book mm -hmm. and he opened the book up and I mean, he had highlights, tabs, okay. you know, stars. I mean, it. yeah. And that's the kind of book it is. It's mm. not a traditional workbook with, mm -hmm. you know, pages where you write in, you know, blank pages where you have questions and answers. Right. But it is kind of a workbook mm -hmm. in the sense of uh, the kind of practical wisdom that is being spread along right. the way. So when I saw that from that young man, and then mm. other young men have had the same reaction. 
Yeah. It made me feel. So he brought the book yeah. up with that, but what was his, what did he uh, want? Well, Do you remember he, that? He, he, yeah, he brought the book up. He had a lot of highlights and a lot of things. And then he read a passage mm. uh, from the book. And to be honest with you, at the moment, I can't yeah, remember what passage he read, that, yeah. but it was something that really was relevant to, to him at the time. Right. Uh, there, like I said, there are a lot of, a lot of life lessons uh, there, uh, one of which is the fact that you do have to uh, set your value system mm -hmm. early on uh, before you're tested. I like to say you got to be, you know, you got to be set before the storm. Yeah, there's no, it's no true. time. I mean, just think about it in the natural. Mm -hmm. You look at people in Florida and on the East right. Coast and what have you, and, you know, the people say, you know, storm's coming. All right, well, then now's the time for you to board up your walls and, and, and get everything, right. board up your windows. But you can't board them up when the storm is there. Right, when you see the storm, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, down the street. Yeah, yeah <laughs> no, it's, it's yeah. no time. Exactly. So you, you, really, you really do have to make some decisions about uh, what your... Uh, code of ethics is, mm -hmm. what your value system is, because everybody's going to be tempted. Uh, there's going to be times where you're going to be uh, pressured, you're going to be tempted, you're going to be, uh, you know, cajoled, and, and you, you have to kind of really know, what is it that I do believe in? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think a young person needs to be able to glean from my experiences the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah, I think everybody's filled with a little good, bad, and, bad, and ugly as well. And they have to first accept that, mm -hmm. I think, and then make the proper changes where necessary and, right. you know, elevate those positive aspects of that in their life, I would say. It took me some years to write the book. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons is because I had to come to a, a place of acceptance about the level of transparency that I wanted to uh, mm -hmm. engage in. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, so and we're going to get in. Yeah. You've had, yeah, um, a lot happen over the years. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take it back a little bit. Okay. Because you're from Compton. Yeah. Right? You grew up in Compton. You went straight to Compton out, High. Straight out of Compton. Straight out of Compton. Yes, yeah, right. What did you think of the movie then? You know, uh, I, I thought that the movie was um, a good example of how important it is to be able to tell your own story. That's, that's pretty much what I okay. would say about it. And I would say this, and that is that that's one aspect mm -hmm. of Compton. In other words, that's from, you know, the, that perspective. the, the yeah, their yeah. perspective that, and right. what they went through. And that's why this book is so interesting, mm -hmm. because from Compton to Congress is telling you another perspective of somebody who grew up on the streets of Compton, right. but with a two-parent household mm -hmm. and who went to Ivy League schools okay. and all these other, whose father was in political life. Mm -hmm. So you, you might, so, so people might say, wow, well, Compton is just about Gangster rap. Well, no, Compton mm -hmm. is about some other things, too. Mm -hmm. Compton right. had the first black mayor uh, west of the Mississippi in the history of this country. So Compton mm. was before Inglewood, wow, before nice. Oakland, okay. Compton. Compton was So your the, father, or was it preceded? He, someone preceded father him. My father ran in that race and was the runner-up. And oh, he, did not, he did not win. He but did he didn't give up because he ended up being there. There you later. go, and he that's part up. of the that's part of the story. He, he wanted he, that. Yeah, he uh, he ran in 1969 mm -hmm. against a man named Douglas Dallahide, and Douglas Dallahide won in the runoff against my father. Okay. And of course, nobody remembers you know who was second place. They only remember the man I who, know. The who walked on the runner up doesn't get the only glory. the man who walked on the moon. <laughs> not that yeah, that's right. But he didn't yeah. give up, mm -hmm. and he ran again, and he lost again. And then he ran the third time. Oh, third time was the charm, there. and he became Look at that. the that. It sounds like the Michael Jordan yeah, of yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, the race. Go. There you go. So he didn't <laughs> you give don't up. You don't stop because mm -hmm. Michael Jordan went through a lot before That's he made right. It. So that's, that's right. great. So mm -hmm. as a child, I'm sure that was a lesson that was instilled in you. Sure. To absolutely. not give up, keep going. If you want something, focus and, and, and just know and not we, believe the naysayers because I think that's a problem for We people. grew up. Uh, with if, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. In fact, that was a funny story. I was at a, uh, speaking of cell phones, mm -hmm, I was at my yes. cell phone store, okay. uh, which was Sprint. This is not an advertisement. <laughs> but anyway, I was at this cell phone store, and something didn't work. And sometimes I said, well, I was talking to this young millennial young lady. I said, well, you know, it's like an old saying that they say, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And she said, oh, yeah, Leah did say that. And I was like, <laughs> Like, it was before Leah, but that's what she could connect with. So, hey, wherever you heard yeah, it, yeah, wherever you heard you it, that wisdom passes down. There you go. <laughs> as long as it's she some got point it on the hear, CD, that's you, like we said, listen. Yeah, that's right. You got to listen. Like you said, receive. Receive and listen, yeah. So, you grew up in Compton. Was it a difficult upbringing, though? I know your father was in the political office and all, but there were some challenges just for that city as well as many other cities in, in Los Angeles yeah, area in the was, 60s. Oh, and, yeah. So. I mean, well, he became mayor 
uh, in 81. Mm -hmm. And that was the, the height of, of, of gang violence, uh, you know, cocaine everywhere, gangster rap, et cetera. So things were really tough. But at the same time, uh, in 1981, uh, I was, at that time, I was uh, in law school. But he was on the city council before that as a councilman. Okay. So when I was in high school, mm -hmm. uh, I got a chance to be at home and, and see some of the things that were going on. And it was tough because he was in political life mm -hmm. and some of the people that I was, you know, peers with or in school with were like, you know, you think you're something, your dad's on the council, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I got, you know, okay. kind of bullied or, you know, pressured because of that. Mm -hmm. And so I had to learn to deal with that and then I had to learn to deal with a lot of things that uh, I couldn't do because my family was very strict. Like, no, you ain't going to that party. <laughs> but everybody going, everybody going to have a good time there, but you ain't going. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so I learned uh, sacrifice at a young mm -hmm. age. Right. Mm -hmm. Did you have siblings? Yes, I had an older sister and a younger uh, brother and sister, mm -hmm. and we were close knit family. Mm -hmm. uh, younger brother and sister, like s seven, eight years younger, mm -hmm. but uh, but basically education was highly stressed in our family because my father, before he was the mayor, was a dentist, and his mm -hmm. two brothers were both doctors. So mm -hmm. we had, they were all doctors. I eventually became the first lawyer, and well, you know, you have to change it, that up. But you, up. you know, yeah. those are usually the two. Yeah, you better be a doctor. Yeah, or a there lawyer. you go. <laughs> So, th yeah. and they built the first uh, medical building uh, in, in Watts, in South L.A. Fantastic. Uh, in the 60s, right after the Watts riot. It was a mm -hmm. multi-level building mm -hmm. with an elevator in nice. 1965. Elevator, penthouse, open. Fancy, fancy. And so, yeah, so I'm looking at this going, <laughs> okay, the bar is set really high. Yeah. These, yeah. these guys are, you know, they're self-made, self-contained, mm -hmm. and black meat. Come on talking about having some role models they were great role great. models and that drove you did that mm -hmm. drive you to do absolutely well, to do great things to right? do great things okay all right well I love hearing about that um, so now we know so any misconception about Compton which should we squash anything people yeah, should yeah, be yeah, comfortable Com going to visit Compton, Compton, with? Yeah, Compton is a great place uh, yes it's been known for violence you know gang violence etc but there are great people in Compton great homes in Compton in fact I went to school uh, in New Jersey, okay. and a lot of my friends were from Philly and New York, and when mm -hmm. they came to visit me in Compton, they're like, this is Compton? They're like, well, <laughs> y'all got lawns. <laughs> yeah, what, they, Pretty lawns, yeah, too, yeah, they're right? like, y'all, they're like, Pff. and when they, when I, and I spent time in Chicago, too. When I went to see the ghettos in Chicago, Philly, and New York, I know what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. So Compton has some nice, relative relatively to other speaking, that have it is a nice, middle class uh, nice. homes and whatever. Yeah. In fact, you know, the, the book deals with the history because before Compton was African American, it was, it was all white. Mm -hmm. So it was a white bedroom community. The Watts riots happened and then white people got afraid mm -hmm. that some more violence was gonna break out, whatever, and they white flight, black came in, and that's when we started having wow. uh, black leadership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why do blacks tear up their own neighborhood quite often? Not all the time, but too often. Yeah, that, that, that's um, it's a matter of consciousness. It really is. And it's interesting you'd say that because uh, when I was young, the Watts riots happened. Right. But when I became mayor uh, in 19, I was mayor in 1991, but in 1992 when I was still mayor, that's when the L.A. riots happened. Okay. And because of the whole mm. fallout from the, you know, the decision on the Rodney King, the Rodney King case, yeah. We started riding, and we were burning up our own town. And I was like, now should I call the National Guard, or should I just continue to let the protest rage? Mm -hmm. And even though I was angry like everybody else, and I wanted protests to happen, mm -hmm. I was like, wait a minute, we about to burn up our own right. city. This is crazy. Exactly. So I said, bring it, bring them in. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said it yeah. a little more fervently. I'm than sure, that. I'm Very sure. Strong. Yes. Yeah, it was. It you was, didn't it was want to bad. see the city torn apart. Yeah, yeah it was really. This was really in '92. This was in. Right? This was. Yeah. The riots happened in April, 90 April 29th, yeah. 1992. 92. Right. Yeah. Se seared in my mind. Yeah. Red letter date. So it was about it was about two days after that mm -hmm. that the riots had continued. It looked like the whole city was going to burn down. I jumped on one of these burnt out cars and got on CNN and I said, "Send in the damn National Guard now!" Right. You know, wow. and they did. They came. So in. you're the one. This is who you were watching when we saw the riots going on. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Wow. But and that particular. Mm -hmm. um, experience was interesting was twofold it helped to save the city but it also helped to launch me 
into the eyes of the public onto my next level mm -hmm. of political uh, service, which was Congress. Which was Congress. Did mm -hmm. you foresee that? Happen? Oh no, I, I wasn't. I wasn't concerned. I mean, I was just trying to save the city at the time. Mm -hmm. But what happened, which is in the book, mm -hmm. uh, the book is just filled with. It's kind of like I call myself the Black Forest Gump. <laughs> Seriously, because okay. I'm telling you throughout the book, I'm there at every major event that happened basically since the 90s. Mm -hmm. OK, so this happens. The, the riots happen, right? Yes. Well, the governor at the time is Pete Wilson and Pete Wilson comes to survey the riot torn area. Mm -hmm. And he's you know, I'm taking him through there and everything else. And I'm asking him for federal aid. And what happens? He says, well, I think I can do that. But there's somebody I want you to meet. I'm like, well, who else I need to meet? You're the governor. You're the man. Was it? <laughs> I'm he at said, the top. Right. I'm the president. Said, no. And that's who it was. <laughs> yeah. See, I'm trying. To see, that's I'm what happens. He said, I went, "Yeah, you, you got it, Carla." The president. President George Bush. Yeah. And then I meet George Bush the next day, but here's the big payoff uh, surprise, and that is, I meet George Bush, and I'm lobbying him, saying, "Mr. President, we got to have this aid, put Compton back together." Right. We've had over $100 million worth of damage. Mm. Like you said, we tore up our own yes, businesses, yes. even though people at the time were mad at Korean businesses or whatever. But, mm -hmm. they, but fire knows no color. I mean, exactly. they, it was just burning up everything. But guess what? I'm lobbying this man. I'm talking to him just like I'm talking to you. Pictures in the book. Mm -hmm. They're all right in there. And he says, well, that's fine. That's fine. But let me tell you a story. And I'm like, look, I don't need any story. <laughs> I, don't I need, your story. I need, I need to hear money. you talk about the money. That's, <laughs> he says, let me tell you the story. He says, I said, okay. Uh, he says, uh, you know, he said, I was in the war in World War II and I served our country. And he said, and uh, he said, during that time, my wife and I, uh, our, our residence was in Compton. I said, what? Mm. He said, that's right. He said, we used to live in Compton. He said, and those are some of the best years of our life. My he said, goodness, in fact, I didn't he know said, that. Our fact, he said, in fact, our son George was also born in Compton. So, make mm, a long story mm, short, mm. there are two United States presidents who lived in Compton. All right? Yes. George okay. W., yes. the father, and the son and the was son. born in Compton. Right. And, and wow. he said, so Mayor Tucker, he said, I have a very soft spot in my heart for Compton. He said, you'll get your money. So, I said, I'm glad I listened to the I story. was just about <laughs> to say, I know you were glad you heard right. that one. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, Look that's at the way that. It I'm def and I'm sure, as the mayor, that continued to affect you moving forward. Absolutely. With that knowledge. The yeah. next day, my picture was with the president, shaking hands with the president on the front page of the LA Times. Right. And before you know it, I just went up and up and basically won the and congressional election. And came in and helped you, right? Mm -hmm. So then, you know, Congress, everybody was like, you got to run for Congress. You got to, because that, I mean, to accomplish helping your city like that, going right. through something so devastating right. that the nation looked at, like you said, I guess everybody thought, hey, if you can make it through that, you could turn around that city and you could bring the community together. You can, we need you in Congress. Right, exactly, yeah. to be that voice. And even though we had had uh, a black man represent Compton in Congress, mm -hmm. Mervyn Dimley, who, if you know, Mervyn Dimley had an illustrious career, is only African-American lieutenant governor in the state of California, mm -hmm. but he was from Trinidad, mm -hmm. he was not from Compton. He's not not a local yeah. guy, and mm -hmm. so for 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 Comptonites to be able to send somebody right. uh, from the hood, oh, I mean from the city, <laughs> to <laughs> D.C. Right, right. You know, I grew up watching. You That's know, another book. From yeah, the that, hood to D.C. Yeah, there you <laughs> go. I grew up watching Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. I'm old enough to remember that oh movie, and so I like, wow, you, can I go to Congress? And yeah. I end, I ended up. That's the you know why right. the book is entitled. From Compton to Congress, mm -hmm. His Grace for My Race is the subtitle, okay. which lets you know that all this was done by the grace of God. Uh, yeah. All these things, yeah. meeting the president, right. being at the right place at the right time, saying the right things, the favor of God was with That's me. That's right. And so, yeah, I went off uh, and I ran. So and how did I, that and I go? Won. How did the race go? Was it an easy race for you? It, it I mean, was, all races are difficult. It, it was a tough race <laughs> because the uh, incumbent congressman, he didn't run against me or I didn't run against him. But he, he retired, but he was running his daughter, Lynn oh, Dimley. Yeah, yeah, Lynn Dimley. Yeah, and so even though he wasn't running, mm -hmm. his heir apparent was running. All his money was there, mm -hmm. name, the machine, the and political machine. And people knew him yeah, from they, being in office. So that for you to right. win that, that's Oh, yeah. It was, it was a big. really, really tough race. And uh, the night of the election, mm -hmm. we were behind. We were behind mm -hmm. by 1,000 votes. It was like 2 Ooh. in the morning, whatever, we were behind. And uh, we were in a hotel room, got together, and we were praying. And after that prayer, everything turned around. The, the tide turned around, the n numbers changed. We moved ahead and never looked back. And mm -hmm. I became 
uh, not only the only African American to go to Congress from Compton, but at that time, I became, and still today, the youngest yeah. African American to ever go to Congress from the whole state of California at 35 okay. yeah, years old. I was going to ask you, does that stand still? That still, still stands as a good thing and a bad thing, because <laughs> somebody should have broken I, that record by yeah. now. But it, it still stands. I'm surprised, yeah, because there's, but from Compton. Yeah, but not no, from. From all of California, California. I'm the youngest black person to ever go to Congress. Okay. Before that, at age 36 or 37, was Ron Dellums mm -hmm. in Oakland, but. That's it. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, for you, I think it's a great record to have. But yeah. you're right. There, we need more young leadership, yeah. and we need more in, in the state yeah, of California. And, and, the, and that's part of part of the book also to inspire others. Uh, you know, records are made to be broken. Yeah. And to inspire others to get involved, particularly we look at what's going on right now mm. politically. Uh, just it's beyond. <laughs> yeah. Every words day. Words beyond imagine. Yeah. Every day. Yeah, every day there's something <laughs> crazier and wilder. And, yeah. it, you know, I grew up with the saying that if you're not a part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And to be on the yes. sidelines, that doesn't mean that everyone has to necessarily run for office, but you need to be politically savvy and politically active. Right. Yeah. And sometimes people ask me, well, now that you are a pastor, mm -hmm. you know, are you still active? Oh, very much so. You know, I've got every elected official on speed dial you know i know really <laughs> yeah, you stay very well, we, in tune with them, yeah. it's relationships yeah i don't Politics think that's something you can totally let go behind you because you cared about yeah. the change of the community and that's something that's going to always be with you right and i'm sure at your church which we are at now yeah. you're 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 tell a little bit about your church so we can get into the ministry point yes um well i've been a pastor the now for 15 years but mm -hmm. this particular church truth and love christian church in the city of Carson, California, is a church that I founded six years ago. So here we are, uh, right here at mm -hmm. Truth and Love, right in the great city of Carson, California. And you, and, uh, you were a pastor in Chicago, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I, I pastored, uh, I, good Lord, I, <laughs> I worked for a few different ministries before okay. I started my own. Mm. And again, the, the lesson uh, of life from that is, you know, before you can lead, you have to be able to follow. You know, before you right. can be the man, you have to you have to serve. Mm -hmm. You know, the Bible says that uh, Joshua, it, it introduces Joshua and says, Joshua, the servant of Moses. And the yes. Lord said, as I was with Moses, I'll be with you, Joshua. So mm -hmm. I served a lot of people. I served uh, Dr. Frederick K.C. Price at Kinshaw mm -hmm. Christian Center. Oh, yeah. I was the head usher there. I was over the Helps Ministries there. I served... Uh, uh, Chuck Colson with uh, Prison Fellowship Worldwide, oh, no. uh, Dr. John Cherry uh, with From the Heart Church Ministries. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these ministries, and it was From the Heart Church Ministries mm -hmm. where I was assigned to Chicago. And we were in Chicago for nine years. Yeah, it's a long time. Yeah, yeah. For, that's a whole other yeah, city that's that needed whole, some, oh, some help. Oh, yeah. absolutely. I mean, yeah. We were on the south side of Chicago. I'm not talking about in the well, suburbs. Well, you were straight oh, yeah. out of Compton, yeah, that's so, right. you, know, so you can could, handle it. We you could, can handle in it. Fact, <laughs> in fact, my boss at the time, my overseer, I asked him why he sent me there. He said, well, I think you can handle it. <laughs> You're from Compton. I think right, you, right, can, I think you yeah, can handle the south side trust of me, Chicago. Trust me, we went to, from, the, from the tough streets of Compton to the mean streets of Chicago, <laughs> and the only thing different was it was a lot colder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I'm sure you changed a lot of lives in that ministry we, we, there. We were very proud. We started off uh, basically with 30 members, and ministry grew to over 650. Mm. We bought a building there. Nice. And uh, after nine years, uh, looked up and said, hey, you know what? I believe it's time to go home. And uh, my overseer said, done a good job, and we're going to nice. send you on home. So Wonderful. came home. Came home. Yeah. You came home, and you've got the church here. Thank you for having me here in, in the church for the show. It's very nice. I think everybody should come visit, you know, for those that are in Carson. 10 a.m. service, Sunday morning worship <laughs> service, Truth and Love Christian Church, where we teach the truth and show the love. Yeah. See? And do you do Wednesday as well as Yeah, service? Wednesday we have Bible study, noon Bible study, mm -hmm. and also evening Bible study at 7.30. Okay. Uh-huh. So we, right. we, we, we keep it going. It's just, it's a teaching ministry and, uh, like I said, a very loving people very loving ministry so come down any time and in fact we're on facebook live every sunday morning so if you can't make it check us out on facebook live oh fantastic what are the, where do they go for facebook live the, the church they yes. follow the church Tru yeah truth and love christian church mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay 
So in Congress, there were highs and lows, like you mentioned. Yes. And you then had some things come about where you had to resign from Congress. That's correct. So let's talk a little about, about that because no one's immune to anything, you know, happening in their life. Sometimes that's bad, right. good. We think we have to deal with the blows. And I, I want to also touch on people judging others mm -hmm. because that's kind of touched in, in, in some people I know lately and how people perceive information that they really don't know the facts, mm -hmm. but they're quick to judge. So that'll kind of segue from what you're going to tell us that, that happened to you. You were incarcerated for a little bit. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned a few of those points, mm -hmm. uh, not only in terms of the importance of the highs and lows in one's life, but also this whole issue of judging. Um, so kind of take them in order. Mm -hmm. First of all, I think it's very important, as I said, it took me some years to really get to a, a level of, of uh, decisiveness about the level of transparency mm -hmm. that I was going to have uh, with the book. Mm -hmm. you know. I, it was going to be good already because people wanted to know the story. They saw headlines in yeah. the paper, you know, congressman indicted, you know, and they were wondering what's going on. And like I said, in this Forrest Gump journey that I had, you know who my attorney was? Johnny Cochran. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Johnny Cochran was my attorney uh, in 1994 mm -hmm. and until he had to get a new client. And you know who mm -hmm. that was? O.J. Simpson. And that was O.J. Yeah. Simpson. I mean, I was literally right there walking through mm -hmm. history. So O.J. messed up your, your, your and case. O.J. <laughs> he took my lawyer. <laughs> took your lawyer. <laughs> and he what had a more good money. lawyer you O.J. had more money than I did at the time. Uh, yeah, I mean, and Johnny yeah. was following plus the money. Plus he had yeah. a, plus, well. They were friends too, of, I think. It, it, money was a part of it, but perhaps the bigger part of it was the whole breadth of that case. That was case a, was so symbolic. A global of, case, yeah, really. It was, the world well, was watching. It, it was called the trial of the century. Yeah. And so, and actually, as history records it, you know, Johnny didn't start out being the lead counsel in mm -hmm. that case. Mm -hmm. he, he got on board on the dream team, but then quickly, you know, his, his expertise yeah. and his abilities uh, brought him to be lead counsel. Mm -hmm. But the point is, uh, I, uh, I was in Congress, I was reelected, mm -hmm. minding my own business, doing the people's business, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden I get a call from a reporter from the Wall Street Journal. I'm at my Capitol Hill desk and I get this call from this reporter saying, Congressman, uh, I'd like to have a quote from you. It's my understanding that you're about to be indicted uh, for something that happened three years ago when you were Mayor of Compton. I'm like, is that you? Willie, right. is that you? Right. Stop playing, man. Yeah. Stop playing. Who, who is this? Stop, stop playing. I'm like, no, mm. this is Andy Pastor with the Wall Street Journal. I had this story wow. about it. I was like, well, wait a minute. I'm like, something that happened three years ago. I can't remember what I did three, <laughs> three days ago. Hold on a second. What are you talking about? Right. Oh, my God. Well, to make a long story short, um, I call Johnny, and we start researching and talking to the um, U.S. Attorney's Office in L.A. to find out what is this all about, and Apparently, it was this FBI sting operation that happened three years prior. Mm -hmm. They had all this evidence and stuff mm -hmm. from three years ago, right. and apparently they were trying to amass a lot more evidence. But the funny thing about all that was the only evidence they had was some stuff that they set up, mm. you know, on me, which really shows you that, left alone, I wasn't doing anything. Yeah. But basically what happened was they had a, 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 a white businessman who had an ax to grind with Compton and said that some people were jamming him up for money. I wasn't jamming him up for any money, but he came to me and said, hey, you know, I need your support for this project and I want to, you know, help out your campaign. I said, okay, good, write a check. And he's like, no, I can't because if the people know I wrote this check, that, you know, they'll, they'll see a connection between your support and, well, that's how politics works kind of mm -hmm. anyway. And mm -hmm. make a long story short, he ended up, you know, talking about how he was a friend of my father's and ended up uh, talking me into taking some cash, which I shouldn't have done, right. and and that is where I made uh, mm -hmm. some big mistakes. Yeah, and it sounds like he probably targeted you to set that system. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, set that up. And, absolutely. I, I believe know. I was targeted. And the big issue in the trial was a question of predisposition. That's really the big issue. Yeah. And it's like, you know, are, were you predisposed to doing that? Well, I wasn't predisposed to doing that, but let's just say that I felt to that temptation of doing that. That's like... You saying, you know, somebody who's beautiful or handsome or whatever comes and steps up to you and says, hey, whatever. And you're like, well, you know, I wasn't even looking to talk to you, but, yeah. you know, now that y'all love it, my face, gonna... good Lord. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so uh, that's yeah. what happened. Okay. I fought the case. And, uh, of course, like I said, Johnny 
uh, had to go fight OJ's case. I got another lawyer that Johnny recommended. We fought the case. We lost the case, and I went to prison. Mm. Now, was the tax situation part of that, or was that even? Yeah, the okay. tax situation was so part of that because... Of that money. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because they, tax the, money that, on the money that... Yeah, yeah, the, the the money that I got, I had not reported, of course. Yeah, I get you know, it. It, yeah, yeah, that, it, 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 it kind of goes together. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so you ended up, what was your sentence? Uh, the sentence was a 27-month sentence. Okay. Uh, and I ended up doing 18 months of it, federal prison. Mm -hmm. uh, the good news was that it was a federal prison camp for you know, quote, white collar criminals. Okay. Uh, and, you know, people say, well, that was, you know, club fed. But prison is prison. One of the first things <laughs> yeah. I learned about prison is, you know, prison is not so much where you are, it's where you can't be, it's where you can't go. So, like, for example, we're in this room right now. Mm -hmm. And if I tell you you can't leave this room for the next, you know, 18 yeah. months, you're in prison. And, uh, mm -hmm. or you could be in prison in a mm -hmm. hospital bed. You right. know, it's just, well, so. Being confined to yeah, a small space. Yeah, being confined to a small space and uh, you're away from family, friends, and your normal life. Right. And uh, so it was a sobering wake up call. But here's the great thing about it, and this is why I wrote the book. Uh, prison was the best, worst experience of my life. It's not something that I would have ever signed up for, <laughs> volunteered for, you know, yeah. those who want to join, take one step forward, no, uh, no, no. Yeah. But having gone through it, right. I can't imagine my life any other way now. Mm. I, I, I was knocked down, uh, but the Lord raised me up, and he helped me to see life in a much different way. It's kind of like, to me, it kind of reminds me of people who talk about near-death experiences. You know, people talk yeah. about near-death, and afterwards, they're imagine. just not the yeah. same. Right, right. Well, I've, that happened. I was in, I went to prison in 19... 96, mm -hmm. so a little over it's 22 years ago, I have not been the same person since. I've been mm -hmm. uh, in full-time, even in prison, I've been in full-time ministry since 1996, basically. So you were ministering in, in Oh, yeah, in yeah, yeah. When I, when I got in, in the book, there's a scene uh, when I was convicted, mm -hmm. and I was out on the federal courthouse steps. I had an out-of-body experience, and, you know, I was, like, looking down on myself mm -hmm. and having this conversation with God, and it was like, okay, well, I guess, you know, you got me now, Lord. Because, I mean, I knew the Lord, but I was you know, living a political life. And, and a lot of things in politics are just very, very dirty. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a dirty yeah. life. It's a tough I think, life. I think we all... Yeah, it's a very dirty life. You know I, mean, I mean, my God, look at our president right now. I mean, I all this stuff he's done. Getting away with. Yeah, getting away with. getting away with. Getting away with. It's, it's, it's mind-boggling, yeah. yeah. So, and the compromises. But uh, when God got a hold of me uh, in that conviction in December of 1995, God said, hey, are you ready now to work for me mm. full time? Are you okay. ready to be sold out and work for me? And I said, yeah, as long as I don't starve, Lord. <laughs> and he said, don't worry about that. I don't, I think I'm, I, think I'm, I think I've done all right on that one. But <laughs> Give me larger yeah, space. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but since that mm. time, I really have been, okay. in one way or the other, in full-time ministry. And mm. then eventually I became a pastor. Right. So did you go, you, then you went to school for theology school and all that? Yeah, I went, um, I didn't go to seminary mm -hmm. uh, as some people, you know, go to seminary officially. Uh, prison was my seminary, really. Mm -hmm. in, in prison, just I, just, right I just poured through the Bible and, and got real deep in what God wanted me to do. And and then everything else, he okay. just led me by his spirit and to do. People were listening. Afterwards, uh, I did uh, go to some uh, Bible uh, universities and mm -hmm. took some classes and things and ended up actually becoming, uh, getting an honorary degree and becoming a professor mm -hmm. on staff. But really, it was the one-on-one -on -one relationship, the time spent just mm. pouring over the Bible. So, of course, yeah. your father, unfortunately, wasn't here to see that. No, happen or no, he was not here he to had, see that he because was, yeah. he because he, he had died uh, in office, mm -hmm. and that's when I ran for mayor. Right. Yeah, he, he died from cancer in office. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So your mother was living and watched it. My happen. mother was living. Mom yeah. saw it all, and she now mom it. is living with me. She Aww. lives with us now. She's, oh, she's a member of the church. I'm her pastor. <laughs> I'm her, her pastor's uh -huh. son. Yeah. And she is, uh, in fact, she's the co-author of this book, Walter Tucker with Martha Tucker. So nice. she helped me write the book. She's a great mm -hmm. a writer and a great editor. Mm -hmm. uh, she's been that way for years right. and uh, was a great 
reason for me writing the book also. Well, with mom on the book, we know all the facts are right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know, mom was right there to make hey. sure. Because if you got it wrong, she'd go, no, 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 this is what happened. <laughs> she Well, right. she pulled out, like I said, all the things that I didn't really want to uh, go that deep. So was she the one it. saying, let's get into all of it, tell it? or uh, Yeah, well, she, she was a should. big part of, of pushing she thought you the should. personal side. It, it, yeah. The book was already going to be interesting because, again, uh, people write your headlines, but you write your story. And so mm -hmm. people wonder, well, I wonder what happened behind the scenes. So there were yeah. things that happened behind the scenes in terms of the legal and the political, but the personal mm -hmm. uh, stories, what happened with my wife, the children, et cetera, et cetera, those are things she really pushed right. uh, me to And reveal. you were married while in prison as well, so that was yes. difficult on, on yes. your wife and family. Yes. But you, she stuck there yeah, with it, my waiting wife for you is, to come out. And my wife is uh, just an incredible woman of God and uh, Robin Tucker, and I'm just so blessed right. to have a woman like that. They broke the mold when they made her. She's, <laughs> uh, she's here uh, uh, over the music ministry, over the women's ministry. They just had a huge women's uh, luncheon uh, just a couple of weeks nice. ago. But going on 33 years in October. Oh, love Mary. congratulations. So, yeah. So, yeah. Very yeah. nice. Yeah. Very yeah. nice. Husband of one wife. <laughs> They've only been married once. And that's it. And that's, it. Want, that's it. it. That's <laughs> it. That's it. I don't. Mm -mm. Now, after 33 years, I understand how this thing works. It, it take, it's like the person yeah. that said, I, "I can't be getting married again. I, I'd have to train somebody all over again." That's <laughs> right. It. Yeah, they'd that's have to train. It. They'd have to train you too. But, yeah. but it is a, it is a getting used to people. And once you are used to that person, uh, it's just like hand in glove, and it mm -hmm. doesn't happen overnight. No relationship happens overnight, yeah. right? Yeah, and I'm so, sure you do a lot of great marriage ministry and, we do. and sessions for, for couples. We do, and we do. Uh, but I must say it's interesting that, uh, you know, uh, people aren't marrying it nearly as much as I, they did in years ago. Yeah, so you're I noticing see. even in your church there are fewer marriages. That. and yeah. I see that, yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Uh, I think it's a, a sign of the times that people are uh, given more to trying to, make up their own uh, sense of what it should or shouldn't be. You know, uh, before and generations before, mm -hmm. uh, I think people had more of a reverence for tradition and institutions. Mm -hmm. And now Absolutely. I think a lot of people are looking at things and saying, well, you know, why not this or why not that? This is the way I think it should be. So, You yeah. think social media is playing a big part in that? Or uh, no? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. I think so. Uh, you know, with social media, you can see that uh, where... Uh, people were were more in the background in terms of their opinions. Now the opinion, everybody's opinion is out there. So I think that is a big part mm -hmm. of it. People, the opinions of people are more celebrated. Yeah, that's yeah. true. It's difficult. Now I touched on judging. So you went through something very difficult, yeah. being incarcerated after what a great career you had, you know, already set forth on. Um, coming out, and I'm sure the newspapers and your colleagues and everybody just came at you hard. Yeah. So, how, you know, what, what should people think about when they, even on social media, they see something that su someone supposedly did or something they did maybe go through or that they were tried and convicted? I mean, how should people really handle that with yes. such a social media, quick to tweet and quick to say things about somebody? Yeah, it's, it's an excellent question. Well, again, the, the, this church is called Truth and Love, and that's because I put such an emphasis on truth. And so whenever I deal with things, I look at the Word of God. And the Word of God says uh, to not judge, uh, lest you will be judged by the same standard that you do judge. So in, in essence, if you think about it, it's not telling you that you should not make value judgments of things like, you know, you somebody is a good worker or a bad worker, okay? Mm -hmm. Those are things that you can make value judgments on. But what it's telling you is be careful to be quick to judge and be mm -hmm. quick to find fault. Yes. And with the same standard that you use, like I said, if you point one finger at somebody, there's three more mm -hmm. pointing back at you. And like you said, you don't really know all the facts, even with social media yes. and even with a lot of information. I mean, my goodness, I got smart news and this news <laughs> and that stuff be right. pop, popping up, jumping up. You you know, this happened right now. This happened right now. I mean, you know, we right. used to wait. We got cable news. You got I know. internet news, phone news. So as soon as something happens, there's a story. But that still doesn't mean you get all the facts. That's why I like these mm -hmm. movies uh, based on true stories because I like to get yes. a look. Not that yeah. they don't take some artistic license. It's for I understand TV. that. It is but for TV. But still to flush out a little more than mm -hmm. just a headline. Right. But back to your point about judging, mm -hmm. uh, at least for myself, I find that based on the things that I've been through, 
uh, that I'm very, very uh, much more slow to judge anyone. Uh, the Bible says, but for the grace of God, there go I. Mm -hmm. I am, and I don't really, and here's the other thing, not only talking about judging other people, I don't care who else judges me. You know why? Because they're not my judge. Ultimately, I, I have That's one right. judge. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's mm -hmm. going to judge me. And y'all ain't going to judge me. You can, mm -hmm. you can talk about me. You can say whatever you want to. And you can have your own opinions. But right. ultimately, uh, God is going to judge me. I, you know, the things that I did wrong, I repented from. I paid for. And the things that I do on a day-to-day -day basis, I seek the Lord and his mercy. The, the Bible says his mercy is anew every morning. So I look for his mercy and his grace every day. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you, you know, if you live your life, it's, it's good to try to, be friendly with people mm -hmm. and be respectful with people, yeah. but don't make people your judge or your God because they're not. That's and right. if you if you try to if you do that, uh, you'll you'll be in prison, in bondage yes. to them, and they're not perfect. And I find too many people are taking action as a result of something on social media, and they're quick to judge. And not only are they quick to judge just mentally, they then want to take action against them. Yeah. You know, yes. and they want to hurt them or strip them right. of their job or you know tear up their career, uh, their family, and it's just like you don't even know what's going on, right. but you want to jump out there. You don't know all the and, facts. And, uh, take You're all that You're jumping out there in action yeah. and, and even, obviously, even uh, violent action. Yes. You know, yeah. who, who, who are you to look at somebody and say, well, oh, they did this or they didn't do this. Let me go handle it. Nobody, right, right. nobody made you judge, jury, and executioner. <laughs> right. We, this is why we have a system. Yeah. It doesn't always work well. Mm -hmm. We understand that. Yes. But, and, and there's a way... Like I said, in terms of civil engagement uh, and and uh, your civic responsibility, right. there's a way to to deal with all things. Yeah. But but for, for you to take a, a vigilante approach, I know, or whatever, right? That's not, it. Yeah. Speaking good. of vigilante, go see Equalizer yeah. too. No. <laughs> <laughs> On that Sh note, Denzel shameless, killed it. Sh shameless plug. It huh? was, it was, but it was. It's the number one movie at the box office. So on on that note, it, it gives. We there's love, some great stories though that t touch upon what we're saying. We love Denzel. And moving to judge and make a decision. The movie you can't predict who you think this one's the one that you want to yeah. be mad at. Then you find it's that. I mean, you really can't follow. Yeah. And it's so. It's a perfect example, really, of what we're saying. Right. You know, you can't uh, decide who is the one that's guilty right. or who's doing something. Wrong. You know the scripture says, "Never judge a thing before it's time." Hmm. In other words, in other words, if you judge something at a glance, you don't you don't really know what's going on. In fact, the more you get into the Bible, the more you realize that when God is dealing with things, He's dealing with things centuries out, thousands of years out. So when you judge something in a snapshot, you say this is good or this is bad, but really. Like my prison thing, mm -hmm. it seemed bad. It seemed it seemed like the, the most terrible thing That's in my true. life, but it ends up being, you know, in a weird way, mm -hmm. the best thing in my life. It's yeah. made me the man I you am today. You received a gift out of that no terrible time it. in your life. Well, all right, look at Nelson Mandela. I mean, God forbid, oh, yes. he want to be in prison for twenty-seven years, mm. but 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 he comes out to be the president of the whole country. Come I on mean, now. He really is. I mean, you don't, you, you know. That's, that's a, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Because people think bad of someone, you know, I don't care if someone's been in prison or not, because of all the, t the conditions, the terms, what happened, what it meant, get the facts. They can come out and do greater things. Right. And Mandela's a perfect example right. of someone that came out to be president again, and people loved him. Right. Um, so, yeah. And, 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 you know, prison not is. Not that he uh, did something, you know, bad, bad to, to get go in, in prison. There. We understand. I'm changing that, right. too. Yes, yeah, make yeah, that yeah, clear. Yeah. I'm not yeah. saying he did something yeah, bad. He was a victim of apartheid. He to get was in. a victim, but, yeah. But even, but, but if we carry it forward, even somebody who did something wrong mm -hmm. and who went into prison, if, if, if that's what it took for them to get the wake up call and yeah. turn around their life, right. and they can come out and be productive. Now, the problem is, you've got a lot of people who've never been in a physical prison, they, they didn't get caught. Okay, that's right. But guess what? But they're in prison, outside mm -hmm. the prison walls. Yes. And then you get some folk who've been in prison, and they get set free, but they haven't been made free. Mm -hmm. Haven't been made free on the inside. Their lives so, don't change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's still you're walking around. You, you know, you're in bondage to to you're in, to addictions and all kinds of things, and you're just you're not free. So, so many things, right? Yeah, you gotta always find the best. Better yourself always mm -hmm. is what I always say to people. Improve, improve. Yeah. Um, the rise in suicide. Um, I know we're coming to the close of the show here, but I want to. This, this is happening so so yeah. often. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say uh, is possibly the reason why it's increased now? And well, what do people do to handle family members that they see having issues? Well, again, um, I go back to the Bible because I'm a man of the word, and the Bible tells us that 
uh, as we get into the last days, and we are in those last days, it tells us that all kind of perilous times will come. And there's so many pressures. There's so many uh, things that are happening. There's so much divisiveness. There's so much despair. And uh, first and foremost, uh, as a preacher, as a priest of God, you do have to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's an interesting point. People say, oh, he's talking about religion. I'm, I, didn't talk, I didn't say one thing about religion. I'm talking about relationship. Mm -hmm. it's, Jesus is uh, the Son of God, and he's a, a person that you can speak with, and he'll speak to you by his Spirit. So that's the first thing. It, you really do have to have that personal relationship. I'm not talking about grandma's relationship. I'm not talking about pastor's relationship. I'm talking right. about a relationship for yourself through the Word mm -hmm. and through prayer. Then secondly, uh, you, you, you have to be able to be open to get help, all right? You can't feel like I'm the Lone Ranger or nobody understands mm -hmm. me, whatever. You have to humble yourself and acknowledge when you've got some problems and, uh, and reach out for help. And churches like this church should be full service. We should uh, be there to help people in all kinds of situations, mm -hmm. which goes back to your point about judging. You know, it, how can you help somebody mm -hmm. if you want to if you're going to judge somebody? Right. You know, it's right. like Jesus talked about this a lot. He talked about it uh, when uh, the woman was caught in adultery, yeah. and he said, "Let him who is without sin cast that's the it. first stone." And nobody right. could cast it because nobody's without nobody sin. Could. I, so that's the first thing. Then he talked about it when he talked about the parable of the the good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. The point there was, you had these guys. One was a priest and the other one was the assistant to, it's like the pastor and the deacon <laughs> and they both walked on the other side of the road because they looked at this man bleeding and said, he, you know he probably high mm, he probably, I don't know what he doing he homeless well, let me leave him alone yeah. but then there was somebody who was a Samaritan which would be the equivalent of uh, a black person finding a white person bleeding down mm. on the on the ground and everything else and went to go help him so that's telling us that you have to go beyond you know, we, we, I know that there's so much going on these days. People are so angry because uh, there has been so much hatred spewed out for people, toward people because of skin color, because of race, whether it be black, brown, or whatever. But like you said, you have to look at your... Michael Jackson was a, was a modern-day prophet. Man, man in, in the, the mirror. mirror. You got to look at the man in the yeah. mirror and ask yourself, but, but, you know, are you a racist? You know, I've heard somebody say, black people can't be racist. You can be, yeah, but racism yeah. is prejudgment That's and right, hatred. Yeah. You can prejudge and hate people just like anybody else can. That's right. So you have to get your heart clean and deal with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Yeah, there's some, there's some white people who are not right. There's some black people who are not right. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. some brown people not right. That's you know, right. there's black folk who will rape you. Asian, just like Hispanic, the Asian. Black, all uh, of, yeah. And Martin Luther King was right. He said, you can't judge people by the color of the skin, but the content of the character. Of the character. So, so I got to look at you and look at your actions and see mm -hmm. how you are. But in terms of my heart, I've got to guard my heart mm -hmm. and make sure that, you know, that, that I don't become the oppressor. You know, yeah. I can't take on the spirit mm -hmm. of the oppressor or I become the oppressor. Right can't do that right, right right well so communication so, so, to so, help people that are having that and, and right, right, right. So, mental yeah. illness is there suicide is high and all this so families should right. listen reach out communicate absolutely those that are having issues reach out and communicate absolutely to close ones family absolutely members. we yeah. have to realize yeah. that there are a lot That's of people it. my son uh, works with LA County and he's working uh, with those who are mental health issues oh, okay great. yes uh, even now and it's interesting because he didn't start out in that job but he ended mm -hmm. up there and just like the conversation you and I have been having about yeah. my life and the different journeys I've been talking with him yeah. and telling him I said you know God doesn't waste experiences and this is a chapter in your life that mm -hmm. God is using mm -hmm. and building Absolutely. to help you become more compassionate and sensitive for where God's leading you yeah. and so you're absolutely right it, it is important for us to be sensitive to other people of any race color to understand people are dealing with a lot of things is also good for us to think about that from a practical standpoint because if 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 the news is proving anything to us you don't know who you're dealing with True. you back back in the day <laughs> you could flip somebody off mm -hmm. and 
tell somebody, give somebody your, a piece of your mind and all this other kind of <laughs> stuff. And they can look like, you know, homie, don't you know me? Right. White guy with some glasses, whatever. And that guy's carrying an AK or whatever. You don't, an uh, AR-15. You don't know you who's don't carrying know. what or what. Yeah. So mental illness is a big thing. And when you can, when you sense that there's some problems, definitely try to uh, uh, provide help, uh, mm -hmm. steer people in the right direction, mm -hmm. get some intervention. Right. Definitely. Okay, that sounds good. Good advice. And I, I preach a lot about of people. It. When that, when that whole thing, when the week happened, uh, you know, with the two bigs, you know, the Kate, Kate Spade and oh, the, yeah. Yeah. and uh, our, our guy, you know, Anthony Bourdain, mm -hmm. um, I, I I talked about it. I, talked that about Sunday, it. I I had a whole message about it. Okay, great. Great. Yeah, it's so important, and I'm sure a lot of the viewers can relate to that and may have family members that need that, that help and support. Ti so The title of the message was, You Have a Lot to Live For, mm. which means that wow. depression is a big thing with a lot of people. that it you. Is. It doesn't have to be mental illness to the point somebody want to you know, right. blow up everybody. Yeah. Just people who are depressed mm -hmm. and feel like, well, I, I don't have anything to live for. Yeah. That's very important to help people to understand. Right. There's a lot. You know, in both of those situations with Anthony and Kate, they both had daughters, mm, didn't they? That's right. I yeah. mean, there was somebody else. John Legend's that, wife um, mentioned Kate, uh, Christy Teigen has had depression after the first child. I know pretty bad. She's yeah, open po about postpartum, it. Postpartum, huh? Yeah. yeah, a lot of yeah. people have yeah, it. Yeah, a lot. It affects your, your, your balance and your, your that's system. That's hormonally and hormonally, everything else, yeah. mentally. So, yeah, we, we have to education, mm -hmm. communication, and compassion. Oh, I like that. Yeah. I like that. Those are some great words of change. Um, and, and yeah, I'm glad you mentioned depression. I do. Yeah. Because I think everybody at some point, it could be not making as much money as you want. It could be not having a right family relationship. It could be not having friendships. Some people have a right. hard time finding friends. So whatever it may be, that can be depressing. Right. You know, um, and people could think everything is great in your life, but you have to go to work. You've got to have a certain face at work. You've got to do things in your daily. But when you finally sit down alone or in your space, you're not feeling as great as you may portray, so do that you, is depression. Do you know one of the things that I have found, I'm so glad we're on this, as a pastor, I've been pastoring going on 16 years now. In the last five years, it's like I've had this epiphany. And one of the things I really see now in uh, preaching, teaching, ministering to people, helping people, is that we have to uh, and the Bible talks about this, and I've known this for years, but it's more emphatic now. The Bible says, uh, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Mm -hmm. We have to start learning to think differently. Mm -hmm. This is the problem. This is the, the Most people's problems have to do with how they, it's not the problem, it's how you think about the problem. Right. How you were raised yeah, is how yeah, you formed yeah, your thoughts. How you things, think, so. about, how the think about the problem. How you think about anything. Like you just said, well, uh, 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 okay, Nobody likes me. I don't have any friends. Well, uh, okay, uh, I went to so and so and spoke to them. They didn't. They, they didn't speak to me. Well, you didn't even know that they didn't even see you. Right, right. But you. But you think. You how many times do you assume things and you think about? Well, nobody likes me. This, that, and the other. And somebody else is sitting there thinking. Oh, I wish I could talk to them. They're so beautiful. They're exactly. so nice. But I'm afraid to talk to them. Right. See, your See, mind is a powerful yeah. thing, it and it is. can take you. That's why the <laughs> Bible talks about the Bible talks about uh, uh, bringing every thought into captivity that is against the knowledge of God. In other words, mm. it says casting down imaginations. Mm. That's mm. why. Hollywood's the way it is. We can imagine a lot of movie scenarios. The mind is very powerful. It's we powerful. can imagine a lot of things, but it can also it can be, be used dangerous. in a negative way. Can you can, you can, like, like this. You know that old joke that said, "It's not paranoia when they really are out to get you." You know, <laughs> right. but but if they're not yeah, out yeah. to get you, yeah. your mind can be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? It can be detrimental right. to your to your um, future. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. I agree with that. Yeah. So people really should think through that and not be so quick to judge themselves. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. A lot of people see the Bible really, when you get down to it, it's about love and it's about love relationship. Right. Now, the Bible tells us there's all these laws. In fact, Moses, there was the Big Ten Commandments, but there were 613 laws that Moses had. Jesus comes along in the New Testament. He says, you can wrap that all into one. He said, you for, lo he said love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and love your neighbor as yourself. He says, mm -hmm. on these two things hang all those commandments. All the other, in other words, let's just that. break it on down. What is it? It's not 
Legalism is not law, it's love. Now, but here's how it works. You love your neighbor as yourself, all right? But you, but you, but you can't love your neighbor until, until you, you love, love yourself. yourself. And you can't love yourself until you, until love. you, until you uh, love God. And you can't love God until you know how much he loves you. Mm. Okay? So then, you, so then what you have to do, you have to first of all come into a revelation knowledge mm -hmm. about how much God loves you, mm -hmm. how valued you are. Mm -hmm. Now you love yourself. Mm -hmm. Because if God thinks I'm this great, I got to be pretty great. Right. All right? Yeah. God says, in fact, God says you're priceless. He let his then son. Like he let his son die here. That's now. right. God says you are priceless. You know how the scripture talks about the woman, Proverbs thirty-one, woman being far. Her price is far above rubies. Okay. So right. you are, you are priceless. Now a lot of us find that value in uh, ethnic studies. You know, we find that in mm -hmm. our history because our history has been so you know misstated and whatever. And that's great. It's great to know our Afrocentric history. But also, it's great to know our spiritual legacy, which yes. is you are, through Christ, you are his child. You are an heir of the God of the universe. Mm -hmm. And like the saying goes, at least the <laughs> one I've been using lately, God takes care of his own. Yeah. He takes care of his own. Mm -hmm. I, I sure take care of mine. That's you know, right. I, I have two children. I have one grandson. And we take care of our own. Well, guess what? God takes, takes care it. of And that's why people own. are forgiven. And there yeah. you go. There you go. So because all this thing forgive. about this thing about judgment and all the people who judge me and everything else, you know what? God bless them because mm -hmm. I already know I'm forgiven. So right. I, I don't need, you know, it's not about what you think about me. The one who's going to judge me and in eternity has forgiven me. Isn't that something? Yeah. Like he did with that woman caught in adultery. He said, mm -hmm. he said, go, he said, he said, where are your accusers? He said, they all left. He said, they don't judge you. He said, neither do I judge you. He said, go forth Yo. and sin no more. In other words, like you said, don't better sin yourself. no more. Yeah, <laughs> better, better yourself, yeah. but you are better forgiven. Yourself. Now, healed people, heal people. Mm -hmm. You're healed. Now you can write a book go, yes. and try to heal other people. But hurt people, hurt people. You know, if you watch Criminal Minds and all those shows on television that give you the profile of serial killers mm -hmm. and everything, right. not to, to justify what they do, but basically nine out of ten of them have all been abused mm -hmm. and, 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 and the victims of somebody, yeah. some other crazy, deranged person. Yeah. And then they go out and they, you know, rape and kill and so all this other stuff to other people. So it's, it's terrible. Right. So we've got to break that cycle. That's right. And that's why on my show, I like to inform, educate, inspire, motivate my audience. Mm. That, those are some words that I love to hold dear. And I do hope and I appreciate them for watching all the time and really appreciate you for yeah. coming on oh, the I, show so much. I appreciate uh, you for having me on the show. Yeah. I thank God for how he connected us that day. Yeah. And like, like I said, you you're a winner twice over. On the natural side, you come from a very great family, the yeah. Gordy family, yeah. and spiritually, you know, you are God's child, and and Absolutely. so you just and now look what you're doing. Like I said, you're you're giving uh, out to so many people out there. I mean, I'm looking at the screen, I'm seeing <laughs> we the see comments that, we and see jumping up, there. and people. Yeah. And you got such a great following. My prayer is that. Uh, can I pray with you? Yes, I was right. gonna, it's on my notes. I have Pray With Me on my show. It's so crazy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, Father, we just bless you and praise you. Thank you for Carla and thank you for her heart of love. That's what it's all about. The Bible says these three things abound and abide, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest is love. And so we thank you that she has a loving heart. We thank you that she wants to educate, inspire, encourage, and build up people. And Lord, the Bible says that whatever we, whatsoever we sow, that we shall also reap. So as she gives to others, so shall it be given unto her. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto her bosom. So we just thank you that the future is bright, the way is made, the door is open, the way is made, and that greater and mightier things are coming her way. We just thank you for her show, and which is uh, just a ministry unto itself. Thank you for all the people out there watching, and we just pray that they'll just continue to spread the love uh, in the wake and light of all this hate and divisiveness out here. Mm -hmm. uh, a great man once said uh, that uh, 
Uh, light doesn't have to do anything but just be, just turn on to dispel the darkness. So we just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Name, amen. And pray for all my viewers to be well in their yeah, families. Bless them. Bless them. Yes. In the name bless of you. Jesus, we speak grace amen. and peace and health and wealth in that order amen. because God is a God of order. You got to get the grace first. Yeah. You got to get the favor of God first. Mm -hmm. Then comes the peace of God. And then the health and healing of God because without a healthy body, it doesn't matter how much money you have. And then the wealth comes in and you'll have enough uh, wisdom and enough character to be able to have as much as God wants you to have. And we know that he said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly, John 10, 10, B section. So we thank you in Jesus' yes. name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Look at the love and hearts. Look at that. Uh, God bless y'all. <laughs> oh, that was so nice of you to do that for everybody. Well, and I, I was going to, I said, please bless my show. <laughs> you got it. So, and you did that and then some. You I love it. it. No, you your story it. is remarkable. Thank you. What you've done. I mean, we, like you said, we've just touched on some of it. There's about two or three more books to come yeah. with more information about your life and your story. But you've the book, it. Mm -hmm. the book is on Amazon. Okay. Uh, from Compton to Congress, His Grace for My Race. So mm -hmm. get it on yeah, Amazon or Kindle. Or Kindle, if you want to do the uh, you know Kindle uh, mm -hmm. option, you can do that. But pick it up, and after you read it, give me a, a customer review because it is climbing up the charts. And no, one day, this book will be a movie, and you'll be able to say, mm -hmm. I read the book. That, I mean, it would know. make a good movie, yeah, though. I yeah. really, really see that. It would be very interesting and motivating. I love things that are motivating because I don't want to go somewhere and just be entertained. Mm -hmm. I don't want to just go somewhere and you know, pay for a movie and just sit and eat my popcorn and go, okay, and you leave. Yeah. I have to leave with something. I have yeah. to leave better than I was when yes. I went out. I have to have something that impacted my mind that I can share with others to make a difference. And that's really what I, I see about life. If I just get up every day and my day is about nothing and yeah. I don't improve something or do something for the good. Purpose. And I always say, make someone smile today, right? That's something I always tell everybody. And it's so important because you can change the whole outlook on that person's day when you walk past them and just smile. Yeah. 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 Thank you. So, well, you've done that. I appreciate it. And tune in every Wednesday, 5.30, and sometimes I come on at 6 when I have to travel for two hours on the road. <laughs> like today. <laughs> um, yeah, that was, that was a long, lot of traffic, but I was safe, and that's what counts. Yeah. But uh, please tune in to Carla Dawn Live, my show. I'm Carla Gordy Bristol here with Walter Tucker III. And you guys, I appreciate you pr uh, tuning in. And please share the, the show. You know, I'm going to have a link up later on YouTube. Follow me on YouTube, but share the show and let everybody see and hear these great words from uh, my guest here today. All right? I'll thank see you, you next again. week. Thank you, Carla. Uh, thank, thank you, you so, much. so much. I really again. appreciate it. Yeah, it was wonderful. It really was. Okay. Well, let's go and have a, a cheer of tea or something. Yes, okay. <laughs> Come on. Bye-bye.